Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ron Miller. I write about the enterprise for TechCrunch. And this afternoon, I'm interviewing Kate Brummy, who is CEO at Mass Challenge, a Boston-based zero equity incubator that helps startups launch, gives them space or build space, um, equity for a little bit of equity for uh, with no expectations of return, and uh, introduces them to the right people in the community to help them survive and thrive as a business and get off the ground. Welcome, Kay. Thank you, Ron, for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, well, we're here to discuss why Boston is a great place to launch a startup. And obviously that's something that you have expertise in given you know, your company and what you do. Um, I, I wanted to start off talking about the universities and colleges that kind of act as a driver to um, you know, start a community in Boston. You know, there's Harvard, there's MIT, there's Northeastern, there's UMass, there's Tufts. There's a lot of world class colleges and universities, all in the metro of Boston area. And I'm wondering why you think that helps drive this Boston startup system that we have. Sure. Yeah, Ron. I think you you dove right into one of the often cited highlights of the Boston startup ecosystem. And it it supports our, our unique uh, environment in a couple of different ways. One is Babson, Harvard, MIT, Tufts, each spin out incredible companies each year from undergrad, from graduate, from their PhD program, directly feeding into our, uh, uh, into our ecosystem. And Second, they support incredible talent and talent density in our area so that companies who are looking for full-time uh, interns, what have you, have sort of direct access to this incredible pool of talent. And I think those two powers combined, much less the incredible research that's happening in labs, uh, make uh, our university system a really unique and potent contributor to our startup uh, community here. How closely does your firm work with, you know, the different university and college incubators? Because there's so many of them. For sure. I mean, as closely as you can, as, as you mentioned, Mass Challenge, we like to think of ourselves as a global network of innovators. We're headquartered in Boston. We have 13 years of working with high impact, high potential companies, helping them launch and grow uh, for no equity at no cost. That model makes us a really friendly first home for many founders who are coming out of labs into first commercialization and or for students who are looking to enter into uh, into the world with their with their startup baby. So we have formal relationships in place with many of the university systems that enable students to move seamlessly from their university uh, support system, for example, to Mass Challenge and informal relationships with as many as we can. You know, I've talked to startup founders who came out of the college system in the Boston area. And when you talk to PhDs, especially ones who are doing lab work, one of the things they've said to me is that once their PhD is over, you know, they have lost access to all this very expensive equipment that they often need to use to do their experiments and to kind of create the things that will drive their business creation. How does having that kind of post-graduate um, you know, system of labs and, and workspaces help kind of drive the ecosystem. Oh, sure. I mean, for sure, coming from a university system where you have not only access to lab equipment, but a robust community, maybe free food, the whole shebang. I mean, it, that's a cushy life. And then you enter the real world. Uh, you know, at Mass Challenge, we uh, provide space for our founders and in fact, for the broader community and are very focused also on providing a community of innovators around them. And we work in close concert with an amazing array of partners across the Massachusetts ecosystem that provide access to lab space, equipment, testing facilities. So Mass Robotics uh, is the world's largest incubator for robotic companies, Greentown Labs, the largest uh, now for climate and clean, clean tech. You have Forge who specifically supports hardware companies, Lab Central in life science, and so our, our powers combined, if you would, uh, provide a really unique support system for founders from community through to equipment. So, you know, I was thinking about it before I got on this call and some pretty famous 
you know, founders started in Boston, but then didn't stay here. You know, you, you think of Bill Gates moving Microsoft to Seattle or Mark Zuckerberg moving um, Facebook to Palo Alto. Um, you know, when when I'm a startup founder and I come out of these Boston schools, there are a lot of different places I could go to. I could go to Miami. It's great weather. I could go to New York. It's got, you know, the glitz and the glamour and it's got Fortune 500 companies at my doorstep. Or I could go, you know, out to San Francisco like Zuckerberg did um, because, you know, it's it's the startup center. It, you know, it's considered like the kind of tour de force of startups, right? Um so, so why why should I stay in Boston? Why should I launch my startup here? What what does Boston have to offer that would be, you know, make me want to stay here and start a business? Yeah, that's great, and certainly highlighting the ones that got away make us mm -hmm. uh, super reflective, also of like our of our journey and what we do well and and what we don't do as well. Because uh, I think you know all ecosystems are unique. A couple of things that we always highlight and that founders highlight back to us first is. Boston is a very dense ecosystem, uh, which makes it uh, easy to navigate a lot of cross-pollination of talent and companies and even investment firms, which is very attractive to many companies. Second, highly collaborative. I think this comes from, in many ways, our DNA and sort of problem solving first, company building second. And so you find an ecosystem that's welcoming, um, as I mentioned, collaborative, um, and really focused on supporting founders that are working on, on hard problems. Third is talent. We started with the university systems as sort of one great example, but uh, talent coming out of companies that are that much farther ahead, also extremely valuable for companies that uh, are just getting started and or scaling up. Uh, and the last is, well, uh, we may not be quite uh, as, as large in absolute dollars as Silicon Valley, we have a high density of venture capital and particularly venture capital with deep expertise and specialization in certain areas that are very attractive to our startup founders. And so, you know, collectively, it makes Mass Challenge a really unique home, particularly for founders that are working on complex problems, you know, with our DNA and life science and enterprise technology, growing in robotics, advanced materials. We're, you know, a, a really unique home uh, for many founders in those areas. So, you know, we, we, we talked about the universities, but Boston has, and the Boston area has more than that, right? It has world-class hospitals. It, it's it got financial services. Fidelity is is based here and, 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 and other financial services companies. Um, you know, there's insurance. There's, there's a lot of different types of um, of companies. How do those kind of established companies, uh, you know, work with you and work with venture capitalists and others in the area and the universities to kind of, you know, in tandem, like you talked about the collaborative stuff, um, you know, how do they all work together to, you know, to help build start have startups, build their companies here? For sure. And I'll also highlight, you know, we have industry, but also public sector partners who are very engaged in innovation, have a long history of supporting even startup-led innovation. So whether it's MITRE or Draper or Lincoln Laboratories, um, deep expertise and, you know, unique technology development uh, through to commercialization. And so, you know, we, um, uh, I think that health tech, fintech, dual use safety and security are three great examples of where Boston is, uh, we think, really in the lead at uh, leveraging our industry and corporate landscape to help startups both do faster customer discovery or research, pilot uh, and co-create opportunities, and then ideally get to scale. M at Mass Challenge, we, we in fact launched our fintech and our digital health practice almost five or six years ago now with support from the private sector and the public sector who wanted to see Massachusetts better support nascent companies in these really critical categories leverage the best of our legacy industries to get to market faster. And so our digital health, our fintech programs are designed to do exactly that, match small startup companies with incumbents uh, like Mass Mutual, like citizens who have interest in being close to innovators and are willing to help them you know, pilot, test, and scale where it works. And so how does that work in practice? I mean, you know, I'm a startup founder. I have this idea that maybe can help, uh, you know, like a Citizens or a Fidelity or, you know, one of the hospitals become, you know, more modern or give them an edge that maybe 
they wouldn't have on their own as a you know kind of an incumbent player. How does all that work together, and how do how do they not? suffocate the startups because sometimes working with large companies you can have this you know like huge entity kind of taking over the development and you know pushing them in directions maybe that isn't you know widely commercial or something like that oh absolutely i've heard it really well described as a startup is like an acorn under a big oak tree <laughs> and with the proper love care sunlight it'll grow grow and hopefully one day um, be as compelling, but the risk is that in the meantime, it gets squashed by the roots, doesn't get sun, et cetera. And so I'll highlight a couple of things about the way the industry works and then maybe how Mass Challenge is uh, engaged within Boston to, to try and you know make it even more effective. We're lucky in Boston that many of these large teams have their scouting or R&D functions based in Boston. And their mandate is to go out into the world knowing the problems that uh, say Children's Hospital or Mass Mutual uh, is trying to solve and identify early stage companies that uh, could be compelling fits against these either short term or longer term challenges, and then provide you know more of a safe haven for early validation and testing and piloting to see if there is a strong mutually beneficial fit before you know moving them into a deployment phase. What we know at Mass Challenge is that's easier said than done. It's actually really challenging for early stage companies to know what challenges or problem sets these big companies have. It's really hard to find the right person inside to navigate procurement uh, and then to move from pilot to scale up. And so, you know, with uh, uh, the co-creation of our corporate partners, we've built a program that's intended to help megaphone out to the world. What are the challenges that these companies face so that startups can match to those challenges. And then we have the architecture to help them mutually determine whether there's a good fit and then if so, move forward. But as you say, it's it's uh, it's hard work and it requires both parties to adapt uh, in, uh, in uh, ways that it feel less natural. How does your own network, I mean, your own network of you know, companies that have come through the Mass Challenge incubator help in that regard because they can probably direct, you know, founders and guide them in ways that, you know, based on their experience, how they were able to kind of make that work. Sure, and I'll I'll, I'll speak about Mass Challenge, but I'll I'll say that I think uh, our example is also what makes Boston great because we have many many founders who have gone through various stages and are willing to turn around and give back of their time, their expertise, and in many cases, uh, their own capital to support the generation of founders behind them. And so certainly at Mass Challenge, uh, the best scenario for us are when alumni who've gone through the programs are willing to and do in fact come back to, to speak, provide you know their experience to other founders. We have an increasing number of alumni who actively mentor and coach uh, our, our startups, uh, and then also to help them uh, uh, break open doors, whether it's with new customers or other partners, et cetera. And so you're, you're absolutely right, that sort of collaborative uh, give back ethos uh, that we inspire to instill in our partners uh, is important and part of the Boston ecosystem too. You know, um, I, as I was preparing for this, I looked at some pitch book data about the growth of Boston's venture capital investment, and it's really exploded, you know, in in recent years. It went from, I think, $17 billion in, in um, 2020 to $34 billion in 21, before dropping off a bit in 22, when I think everybody everywhere dropped off. But why do you, how does, how does this venture capital system that's been really, you know, growing and developing over the last 20 or 30 years in Boston. How does that help, you know, these companies as they, they kind of come out of your, um, you know, space, you know, kind of safe space and get out in the world and they need more money to go to market? Yeah, they, so we're we're excited to see not only that Boston has sort of grown with the growth of the venture capital space, but in, in many areas, um, uh, has outpaced the growth of venture capital elsewhere. Uh, and particularly, I think we see a couple um, uh, exciting areas. Life science has always been sort of a, a, a really 
large life science and biotech large part, but we see a large number of firms, growing firms in the early stage space, which we cheer on. We know that uh, Boston has a legacy of angel investors, but more in the pre-seed seed space are hugely beneficial to supporting a really healthy pipeline in addition to specialized funds in uh, digital health, bioconvergence, artificial intelligence, um, as well over time. And so certainly what we know from our founders is that they want to raise capital in Boston and build teams in Boston. And so the growth of venture capital here um, enables that compared to feeling like you have to go to Silicon Valley. So you talked about the angel investment system, and I think you know that's that's something that has happened over the last, I don't know, 20 or 30 years as companies have developed and you know, gone public or been acquired and created this wealth among startup founders. And you see it with Wayfair, you see it with HubSpot, um, you know, Carbon Black got acquired for a billion dollars or $1.2 billion, Acquia for a billion dollars. So there's been some big exits. Um, there's been some big IPOs. How does that kind of help, you know, drive what you're trying to do at your firm as well as, you know, the system at large? For sure. So one is we are extremely fortunate that uh, some of uh, those individuals give back to organizations like ours. We're a nonprofit. And so we we have to say thank you always uh, for that support. But more importantly, for the for the ecosystem, I think we see um, one is a deep commitment by individuals who have had entrepreneurial success often to give back both with their capital and of their time. And that absolutely creates positive ripple effects to the vibrancy and the growth of an ecosystem. And you also see that in the spin out of talent. And that may be ta uh, talented individuals, executives who similarly share to the upside and so are giving back of their time and treasures, but often are choosing to then go on to found additional companies within the ecosystem, et cetera. So we think that the uh, sort of spawning of positive seeds is uh, something that um, is super healthy, is visible in Boston, and is something that um, we hope we'll see even more of. So you talked about um, life sciences as a strength of Boston, and it certainly is Boston and Cambridge have this share of biotech companies. Um, you know, Moderna, of course, you know, became famous um, because of its ability to come up with a COVID vaccine so quickly um, after the, the pandemic started. Um, what other areas, what other um, strengths, uh, you know, what, what other kinds of startups are, you know, best suited to the Boston area? Sure. So, you know, life science, biotech, obviously a, a legacy strength uh, and continues to be a leading um, category for Boston. In addition to sort of some of the infrastructure and enterprise technology, while Boston is not often as recognized for this compared to Silicon Valley, many of our uh, top performing companies also are in the consumer and fintech categories as well. And those are both areas where we see significant um, opportunity. Uh, we're really excited about a couple emerging categories. One is, I mentioned uh, robotics and climate. Uh, these are areas we think play to Boston's strength, being often based in really technical um, solutions or inventions that are uh, focused on big problems. And I think that's enabled by organizations, not just like Mass Challenge, but Greentown, um, uh, Mass Robotics, uh, The Engine, to name just a few. Uh, we've The state has put significant emphasis around digital health and fintech, and we've seen growth of companies um, in both of those categories. And we think we'll continue to see those, given also, as you mentioned, uh, the incredible legacy institutions here who are committed not only to their own advancement, but to supporting uh, uh, innovation here in Massachusetts. And Mass Challenge, we've been active in the dual use space. It's an area we're excited about. These are companies that have both commercial uh, and uh, government uh, use and with MIT and Draper Labs and MITRE, uh, to name just a few, in addition to the UMass system, we're seeing a really exciting uh, growth uh, of companies in this in this category as well. So when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, one of the things that kind of I, I thought was interesting and exciting is you talked about bioconvergence, which is like combining computer science and and biology. Can you talk a little bit about that and who's doing that? Sure. So this is certainly within the university systems. I think we see intentional investment in departments coming together. So bringing the uh, those in the computer science and those uh, 
uh, in, say, the biology space, coming together to think about how can we solve problems with those powers combined. And uh, it's an area that we think is still emerging. Obviously, you have uh, more complexity when you're when you're looking at both solutions that touch both biology and computer science, but we think could be really powerful and really exciting. Uh, and also um, uh, sort of deeply connected to other areas of expertise around the world. We're active in Israel, and this is an area of focus there as well. So um, we only have a few minutes left. So I wanted to talk to you about kind of the challenging um, environment that we've been in for the last several years. I mean, starting with the pandemic lockdown, and then, I mean, we had a little bit of a, a rise in 21, but then we had the economic challenges that we're seeing in 22 and 23. How has that impacted the startup environment? And how does that, how do startups kind of navigate? And how do you work with startups to navigate these kind of challenging times that we've found ourselves in? Yeah, I mean, it has been an extraordinary couple of years. Uh, and uh, certainly as you think about the stress and the challenges that founders face, all the more so when you're building a company in uh, a uh, within the environment of COVID and you can't actually get in front of customers the way you've been trained to. Uh, uh, or today when there's a major pullback in funding after 10 years of extraordinary capital flow. So, so this is this is a challenging time. Um, I'll answer it optimistically though, which is uh, entrepreneurs are extremely resi uh, resilient uh, beings. They see problems, they persevere uh, with, uh, incredible ambition and optimism uh, and are willing and trained and ready to pivot through challenges. And so I think what we've seen, even in these extraordinary time, is entrepreneurs rise to the occasion, whether that was the acceleration of digital health solutions during COVID, where there was finally an opening and an openness to uh, um, virtual care and treatment, for example, or whether that uh, is um, in the response today around the potential of artificial intelligence to uh, uh, accelerate uh, solutions into the field. So uh, it's a hard environment for fundraising. Uh, that is for that is definitively the case. But what we know is in, from past recessions that some of the best companies come out of the hardest times. So we expect uh, we expect to see an amazing next generation of companies come through in the next couple of years. So a lot of folks have actually never lived through a downturn, right? I mean, yeah. uh, you know, as uh, certainly as you know, adults running a business, um, uh, you know, it's been it's been well, since two thousand eight. Oh, um, yeah. You know, we, we've had a pretty good run. Um, so, so like when you when you talk to especially young startup founders who haven't experienced this kind of environment, like what kind of um, advice are they looking for having not been through this? And I mean, obviously they have to be resilient or they don't survive, right? Yeah. But, you know, they, they're, they're trying to navigate something that is foreign to them. And I'm wondering how you talk to them about that. Yeah, I think there are um, two simple points. One is um, it can get worse than you expect. And so as you plan your downside, uh, have a broader continuum. It will allow you to plan more resiliently and uh, encourage you to make harder decisions than if you think you can speedboat your way your way through. And that certainly, I was a stock analyst in 2008, and let's just say the downside scenarios were not the downside scenarios. And I and so I think that that comes from my personal learnings there. But as we think about how do companies extend their runway get to profitability, right-size hiring patterns, it's really important that uh, they uh, reflect on what the full potential is. And the second is to take care of yourself. Um, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, the company is dependent. Often it's the smaller the company is, the even more dependent they are on the founder. And uh, it's really important to um, take care of your mental health as a founder when the stresses of the outside are so extraordinary in addition to the stresses of building a company even under the best of circumstances. All right, well, we're out of time, but I want to thank you so much for um, you know coming in and talking to us this afternoon about you know why Boston is a great place to launch a startup. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, for letting us make the case. This was fun. Mm -hmm.